So this is an example of sort of a layered, a set of layered configuration issues that leads to a variety of compromises without actually having to use a lot of exploits. It's just misconfigurations of the server, leveraging uh, what I call features of Solaris. So keep it in mind, any vulnerability that you find that allows you to basically read an arbitrary file from a web directory on a Solaris system also allows you to get a directory listing of that directory. So if the folks who don't know that, it's kind of a cool trick and also lets you tell, yes, this actually is a Solaris box. So if you don't know about it, if you do know about it, great, but if you don't, it's, it's a cool trick to keep in your back pocket. Yeah, an another good point to that is if you happen to be able to write to Solaris or like create a directory, but you can't create files, Solaris may treat the directory that you, you create as a file. So you create your file name as a directory, and then under that, you, you make more directories, but those are actually like commands inside the file. It's a good, good, actually, a good example. You could probably actually build out an entire PHP script just by doing make directory and then making directories below that. So the reason Dalla bring those up is they actually has a really awesome bug you can't talk about. And he didn't tell me I can't talk about it. But basically the bug is there's a Solaris service that allows you to create arbitrary directories unauthenticated in Solaris like 10 and 11, I think. So uh, yeah, anyways, he can't talk about that. But uh, using that and basically putting those into a web directory, you can execute PHP code using these techniques. So that's where this stuff is going, but yeah, him. So anyways, <laughs> so on to the DNS servers. Uh, so you're attacking DNS servers, the first thing you want to do is basically brute force host names. Try to figure out what internal names are mapped. Try to figure out what host names are mapped, like VPN dot, admin dot, HR dot. The same things you normally look for are virtual hosting, but also apply to the host names. Um, something to keep in mind is when you see something like a server called Zeus, go ahead and brute force the whole damn you know, pantheon as well, because uh, people tend to follow similar naming, tech, you know, uh, naming conventions. Same thing if you see something called you know, Neptune, look for you know, Saturn, look for Mars, things like that. Uh, pretty basic stuff. So one thing you can do if you can force the remote side to do DNS lookups for you or do DNS lookups against your system is do like uh, transaction ID analysis. And what transaction IDs allow you to do is basically if you can predict them, if you can predict the source port and the transaction ID, you can cause a spoofed entry to end up in the DNS cache. And that's a great, beautiful thing for so many reasons. So we won't talk about why that's important. Hopefully you know. Um, but sending everyone who goes to the internet site to, to go see is a good reason why that'd be fun. Uh, so for example, uh, with buy nine, it had an issue with uh, birthday attacks, which basically means there's only 65K possible transaction IDs. And if you know the source port, it's pretty easy. So you just keep brute forcing by sending so many responses back that eventually you manage to get one to hit. And at that point, you, you spoof the cache. Um, a recent vulnerability has been the PRNG that Bind9 uses to generate transaction IDs has been shown to be flawed and you can predict the whole damn thing. So uh, you don't even have to do a birthday attack. You can just figure out where you are in the PRNG chain and do that and figure out, okay, well, the next, PR, the next XID based on this chain is going to be this. Return that response and now spoof any host name you want um, into the cache. And there's actually a whole, you know, all the proof of concept code was posted for this. We didn't do it. I'm just saying you should look at the stuff because it's a really cool new attack. Um, finally, there's a product called VXWorks. Has anyone heard of it? Great, okay. So VXWorks is actually used under the shell of tons and tons of little appliances, little firewalls, little NAT devices, all kinds of crap. Um, unfortunately, every device that my company and my coworkers have looked at um, that runs VXWorks has a really shoddy DNS client. Uh, we've reported a bunch of bugs specifically to the vendors that base their products on VXWorks, but not to VXWorks themselves. And the reason for that is, well, you know, VXWorks isn't that interesting, but the products that are based on it are. So in this case, uh, we found an issue where the VXWorks, if you do a DNS lookup from inside VXWorks, the source port and the transaction ID are completely predictable. They just increment. So it starts off at like 1023, and then goes to 1024, 1025 for the source port, and the XID just starts off at 1, so, and then wraps back. So if you can ever get one of these devices to do DNS lookups and want to basically spoof a cache entry into a VXWorks device, it's completely freaking trivial. You don't even have to try. So if you see a firewall or NAT device or VPN based on this product, um, it's flawed if they do any kind of DNS lookups using the native VXWorks resolver code. And finally, one extra technique that I found works once in a while, and I don't know whether this is just the F5 server I tested or it's common configuration. It just happened in the wild, so it's hard to really you know, pinpoint what software is in use, is when I force the client to look up a host name under my fake subdomain, I returned an A record, but I also returned another A record for their own host, and it ended up overriding their own entry. So just by returning extra responses to some DNS servers, you can actually override existing entries in the table. And it was probably a non-standard server, but definitely keep that in mind if you're doing a DNS server attack or an audit based on a DNS server. All right, so this is where we start to get to the fun stuff. Um, one of my favorite things in the whole world is SMB. SMB being the server message block, AKA kind of the NetBIOS transport, kind of the thing that makes like Windows boxes talk to each other for the most part. 
Um, it's what Samba uses. It's what uh, um, almost all the RPC APIs inside Windows actually get transported over, over SMB or directly over DC RPC. Um, so it's all kinds of fun stuff. And if you can get one of these SMB clients to talk to your server, you can, you can play hell with it. You can do all kinds of great things. So the first thing you can do is if, if you can force them to connect to your server and try to access a share name or an image, um, you can just steal their hash. And by stealing their hash, I don't mean the raw landman hash. I mean the hash, which is the raw landman hash encrypted with a challenge key you provide them. So that's the way it works. You give them a challenge key, they encrypt their hash against the challenge key, send that to you. Um, if you create a static challenge key, and a friend of mine who's actually here at the conference today has a, uh, a rainbow table where you basically hard code the challenge key and do all the permutations and build up about 300 gigs worth of data, and then you can do lookups on it, you can basically break the original password just based on this hash password as well. So you can do rainbow cracks against this as well as just a standard layman lookup. So you don't even need the cracked hash password, you can just use the, this password as long as you hard code the challenge key in your rainbow table as well. <coughs> so one of the best things about NCLM is how it's standard. It's the same NCLM authentication on your IIS web server that accepts IIS, you know, uh, negotiate, NCLM authenticate, whatnot in your HTTP header. Um, it's the same authentication that IIS accepts by default that your mail server, your exchange server uses for authentication. Um, same thing that your, uh, your POP3 servers uses, that your IMAP server uses, that your SMB server uses. So if you can get one of those protocols to come into your system and someone to authenticate with that protocol, you can turn around and pipe that protocol straight back to another host on some other protocol entirely. So for instance, uh, is anyone here familiar with SMB relay attacks or SMB relay 2? All right, well this should be new stuff and it was actually, it's been around since like 2001 or even earlier than that, but it's really useful stuff and still applies to the latest versions of Windows and whatnot. Um, basically, if you set up a fake SMB server and you convince someone to browse your share, just do backslash backslash your IP address on a local subnet, when they connect to you, you connect back out to their external mail server, you connect back out to some other server that they can normally authenticate to, and you ask that server for the challenge key. You say, please, give me your 8 byte challenge key. It says, okay, it gives you a challenge key. You turn around and you give that back to the client. The client will see that challenge key, and if you do it right, you can force them to authenticate thinking they're talking to their own system or talking to a real system, and they'll automatically authenticate against that challenge key. You know, they'll encrypt their password to get the hash, then they'll take that hash and encrypt that hash against the challenge key, you pass it off to the real server. And then you kick the client to the curb and take over the session. They're like, all right, thanks, Bob. I got your email now. So uh, that's one way, if you actually, have, if you allow outbound SMB connections from your internal network to the internet, and a whole lot of ISPs all of a sudden stopped blocking it in the last two months, it was great. So Time Warner in Texas no longer blocks outbound 139.445. So if you spam a whole bunch of Roadrunner users and say, hey, uh, here's this really cool email, and in the image source you do backslash, backslash, the IP address of your external mail server, external SMB server, forward slash share, forward slash that, and in return you pipe all that back out to uh, Roadrunner's mail gateway, excuse me, Roadrunner's uh, a web interface, which accepts interlim authentication as part of the authentication process, you can basically take over their email accounts. And granted, anyone who uses Roadrunner email, you probably aren't that interested in their email account. Uh, but we're going to go into more of this stuff later. So that's the basic idea, is that you can accept authentication from one protocol, from one user, and turn around and either apply it directly back to them, or apply it to an external service and just use that to bust a shell or get access and so on. And we'll go into a really cool demo of that a little bit later. So finally, uh, social engineering, which we didn't really want to talk about this that much because people say, oh, it's just another social engineering talk, but don't forget about this stuff. It's, it's so easy, it's, it's not really much point in not talking about it. Um, print out a couple CDs, put you know, a free version of Office on top, you know, make it look like something commercial that's free and pass it out to people going into a building. I and mean, people just take it and plug it in. I mean, it's not rocket science, but it's still really effective and make sure you don't forget it as part of your testing. Um, if you want to go beyond CD-ROMs, because CD-ROMs, people realize, oh, these things might be dangerous, let's not use them. Uh, you can actually just take those USB keys, like the U3 auto run, which I don't, really, I don't like the U3s because they're hard to actually hack. But I do like those, the UDRWs, which you can get from Hagiwara, which I probably pronounced terribly wrong. But those devices, they give you a whole SDK for it. You can develop it. You can build your own auto run tools. And I've built a whole lot of them. And you can walk up to, let's say, uh, Target, you know, where there's a little employment kiosk where you can sit down to become a Target worker. Um, so they actually have USB keyboards. And the keyboards accept more than just the, key, the USB slots take more than just keyboards. So unplug the keyboard slot, plug in your auto run, and you just launch your worm on the target network if you wanted to go about doing those things, which I don't endorse. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> next up, so if you got like, if you're like a, a big baller and you got like lots of money and you really want to break into a network or you're getting paid like, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars for a test, um, go out and buy a Nokia N800. Go buy an N770. 
go buy a really cool little portable handheld computer, hold the fake sweepstakes, and send it to somebody saying, hey, you won this really cool handheld computer. And most of these devices just run Linux. So you just put your entire automatic auto-owning toolkit on this little Nokia, send it to the CEO and say, hey, you won this cool device as part of your sweepstakes at this conference that you don't remember going to. And he goes, ooh, shiny, and starts playing with it. And first, the first thing he's going to do is plug into the network, set it up on Wi-Fi, and the second it does, you make it rip everything out of there, dump his password, and send it off to you. So if you got the money for it, which is only about a couple hundred dollars now, Woot.com had a special on these for 200 bucks each for uh, N770s. Um, it's a whole lot of fun, they're dirt cheap when it comes to you know, the relative cost of doing a pen test. Um, finally, a really cool hack I saw, I think it was like Hackaday or Engadget, is someone took one of those uh, UPS power bricks, where you ha it looks like a uh, you know, surge protector, but it's much fatter, uglier, and they ripped it, opened it up, ripped the battery out, threw it away, put an Ethernet switch into it, uh, placed the uh, uh, OpenWRT core, just basically ripped all the case off an OpenWRT, put a flash card on it, stuck it inside of it, put it on the Ethernet port, and they ran the Ethernet in one side, back out the other side, and so on. And they just basically put their own little evil server inside the UPS backup. Then they just threw it over their shoulder, walked to a building, said, oh, we're here to fix that UPS. Uh, where it went bad, the one by the printer. Swap it out, done. So really simple things, but if you think you're like, you know, a cool hardware engineer and you want to like mess with this stuff and uh, you also do pen testing, definitely let, those, let the innovation continue. So those are really cool um, ways to own boxes and they're lots of fun to make. And the, the clients will be like, who to what? You did what to my what? And lots of fun. So finally, we're on to the internal network, and I think I handed off to, no, almost. So internal network, this is kind of the soft, chewy part. Once you're inside, it's almost game over, and it's almost always game over. But we want to talk about some different things you can do once you're inside the network, or if you're inside of a really big network where they pretend like they have internal security. So first off, NetBIOS names. The name of a machine on the network as advertised by NetBIOS. So those things can be magic sometimes. Uh, for example, anyone know what, if you set your NetBIOS name to be WPAD, Anyone know what that does? Proxy. Excellent, right. So Internet Explorer has a built-in feature for proxy detection. And the way it figures out what proxy to use when that thing is checked, which it is by default, and it's still on about half the workstations I've seen on the corporate network, um, is when it first starts up and tries to browse the site, it looks up a name called WPAD. Now with Internet Explorer 6, there's actually a bug where um, it not only looked for a NetBIOS name called WPAD, it looked for WPAD.its own domain, like WPADmybank.com, and then it actually went ahead and looked up WPAD.com and we try to use that as the wpad.dat server. So if you want to get a, a, a kind of a belly laugh out of this, check out wpad.com. There's some guy sitting there saying, why are you sending me a request? What did I do? <laughs> so, <laughs> so we finally figured it out. He's like, all right, so it must be these auto proxy stuff. They put a little like helper page up there saying, okay, here's how you disable it. Stop hammering my damn server people. <laughs> but the funny thing is, if let's say, I mean, if you talk about domains you want to bid on, that's a domain I would love to own. <laughs> Because at that point, you own every single Internet Explorer user on the freaking planet will go through your own proxy server. And at that point, the games begin, right? So, uh, so they finally fixed that Internet Explorer 6.0. And you know, everyone rejoiced. It's like, ah, finally, we're done with that. There's not some random Internet host that controls what every client of my organization does now. And then with Internet Explorer 7, they broke it again. So uh, <laughs> welcome back to WPAD. <laughs> um, another magic name, which isn't that important, but if uh, you have Computer Associates products in your network, is CA License. And this is the default license server used by CA products. If they connect to this, and this server uh, receives a UDP packet on like 4325, it's some high port. We've got a bunch of exploits for it and Metasploit. But if you respond back with a whole bunch of crap, 90% of the time you just kill the server. And there's so many bugs in that damn thing, I got tired of auditing it. Um, but basically, if you make your host name CA license, you can cause hell as well. So this is where it gets interesting. If you run a Microsoft DNS server, and your DNS server is also your DHCP server, what happens is, anytime you specify a host name, it's your DHCP client.